Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the 30th annual Westheimer Peace Symposium, focusing on peace and the nature of war through a special two day symposium entitled The Nuclear Threat Past, Present, Future, in commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan, by the United States. This event is brought to you by Wilmington College and the Westheimer Peace Symposium Committee. Amidst the uncertainty of a global pandemic, we gather together virtually for the first time for this symposium to celebrate the 30th anniversary in order to ensure the safety of those in our community, as well as our speakers and presenters. My name is Tanya Moss. I am the director of the Wilmington College Peace Resource Center and the coordinator for the Westheimer Peace Symposium. Before we turn to Arjun Makijani's important talk, I would like to provide just a little bit of additional information about the symposium. This year is a special collaboration with the Wilmington College Peace Resource Center, which holds an extensive collection of archival materials related to the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the human experience of nuclear war. It is also held in collaboration with the Response Project funded by an Ohio Arts Council grant. We are grateful for their support. This project was conceived of by pianist and Wilmington College music faculty, Brianna Matsky, in a series of response projects. And you can learn more about them simply by Googling response project. For the Peace Resource Center response project, seven artists across the United States have created deeply creative and original compositions for the symposium in response to archival materials from the Peace Resource Center archives. For a full schedule of today's lectures, performances, please go to wilmington.edu backslash Westheimer. In addition, please join us for the keynote here on Facebook Live at 6.30 p.m. with Dr. Carlos Umania, who is a member of the International Steering Group of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons and the International Physicians for the Prevention of War. He's the Vice President for the Latin American Branch. His talk is titled Abolishing Nuclear Weapons Through Humanitarian Disarmament, A Fight for Us All. Just a note in terms of technology. Last night we did encounter unexpected technology problems in the interface with our live stream to Facebook. This apparently was a problem on the side of Facebook and it was not something our technology staff could control. Should we encounter similar difficulties today, please look at the Peace Resource Center Facebook page for announcements and direct links where you can find your way to the lectures throughout the day. Uh, and that's only for the lectures for the Facebook live stream lectures that are noted as such on the schedule. All the workshops will go on as um, according to plan. So that's just as a backup. Other than that, you can assume we'll be zooming live stream to Facebook and we hope we won't encounter any problems at all. Before I turn to our speaker, I want to extend just a, a some thanks to the many individuals who made this symposium possible. We're a very small college about, of about a thousand students. And each person who contributed to bringing this symposium about took on something extra above and beyond their already extensive duties of teaching and service at the college. Really, truly, um, this is a matter of the heart for many of us. Um, and so we are thankful uh, for all of those who, who help with this. I want to thank all the members, both staff, faculty, and students of the Westheimer Committee. Thank you also to Interim President Erica Goodwin and her staff for their ongoing support of the symposium and for her comments yesterday. A special, very special thank you to the Westheimer family and Mary and Bill Westheimer who have provided comments for this year's symposium. We are very fortunate to have this opportunity to celebrate and strive toward peace gaining awareness and knowledge each year at the Westheimer Peace Symposium. And without the generous endowment from Charles and May Westheimer, their parents, we would not be having this symposium after 30 years still. So we are very thankful to them. 
Thank you also for the to the PRC and QHC student staff for their constant support and willingness to help in any way with all things uh, related to Westheimer. Um, I am so deeply grateful to, for the students that work with me. Um, they are a solid rock upon which I can rely and depend. So thanks to all of you. Last but not least, a huge thank you to our technical support team and all the students in Mitch Blank Spores class who are helping out with the symposium today. So now to our speaker. Today we welcome Dr. Arjun Makijani. Dr. Makijani is an electrical and nuclear engineer and president of the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research. He has been doing nuclear studies for 40 years. Dr. Makijani has a PhD from the Department of Electrical and Engineering and Computer Sciences of the University of California, Berkeley, where he specialized in the application of plasma physics to controlled nuclear fusion. He has testified before Congress and has served as a consultant on energy issues to utilities and other organizations. He has also served as an expert witness in Nuclear Regulatory Commission and in federal court proceedings on nuclear facilities on a variety of issues, including releases of radioactivity from nuclear facilities. He has testified before Congress, written and co-authored books and reports on energy, nuclear and democracy issues. He has also researched and written on the decision to use atomic weapons in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. His talk today is entitled, Replacing CO2 with, CO2 with Plutonium, why nuclear power is a poor approach to reducing CO2 emissions. Arjun, welcome, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. All right, I have started my video. Uh, thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Westheimer family. May I? I think I. Will I be able to share my screen? Let me try. Uh, there we go. Can you all see my screen? Tanya, can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Westheimer family. Um, let's see. Okay, I even had a little fun preparing this talk on a rather somber topic. Um, it has also to do with climate, of course, replacing CO2 with plutonium or nuclear power. Uh, CO2 emissions are about climate. I'm not going to talk a lot about climate, assuming that 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 um, people do understand we have something of a climate crisis. Uh, here's I had a little fun trying to explain what is nuclear, what is a nuclear power reactor, and I have these two wonderful photos from Finland. The left is a kettle and a boiling at a campfire, the Finnish campfire. And the right is the Okilioto reactor being built currently in Finland by sort of the paragon of nuclear and energy in the world, France. It's a French design reactor, it has been under construction for 15 years, not yet complete. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but I thought it was fun to tell you that these two technological devices are essentially the same. On the right is supposed to be more advanced and updated, but uh, with some downsides. Let's see what's un under that dome. We know what's in the kettle. It's water that's boiling for coffee. All right, this is a nuclear power plant. It's a pressurized water reactor, the most common kind in the world. Um, initially designed for a uh, nuclear navy in the 50s. Uh, part circle by the red is the, is the nuclear reactor here in the yellow and red and orange. And on the right is the, where the hot water goes to make steam. So this whole thing is really just a boiler. A nuclear reactor is only a boiler. It just boils water. And then the steam goes to the turbine. And so the difference between the picture on the right and the picture on the left is on the left, the fuel is on the, the fire is on the outside. And on the right, the fire is on the inside. It's this 
fuel rods that sustain a chain reaction, make the water very, very hot. And that water is sent to a heat exchanger. Uh, this is called the steam generator. And it makes steam that drives the turbine, that drives on. All right. Uh, so really, this is the only piece of uh, the um, power plant that is different, say, from a coal-fired power plant. Coal-fired power plant will have a fire on the outside, just like that kettle. Here we have concentrated fuel. Now, you know, the amount of energy produced by a single fission of a uranium atom is, is a very, very large fraction of the energy produced by um, uh, uh, an atom of carbon in coal. Uh, that's a big difference. Uh, so how did we get to the age of nuclear power? Uh, it's not what you thought. I researched this because, you know, there was this phrase, nuclear power will be too cheap to meter. And I thought for quite a while that it had been a mistake because in the, you know, nuclear power turned out to be quite expensive as I'll explain. And then I was in the stacks of a library and I found this journal called Atomics from 1948 or 49. And an editorial was written by somebody from the nuclear, uh, from the electric industry who said, nuclear power is going to be very difficult and costly. And I thought, that's not what I thought they were thinking back then. Um, I thought they thought it would be cheap because the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission said so in 1954. So we did a little research project is where did this idea of too cheap to meter come from and who thought it and why did they say it? It turns out that the industry, the Atomic Energy Commission, academia, they all thought nuclear power would be very expensive. It's just a boiler, remember? And this is a much more expensive boiler than coal. It's much more complicated, it's more dangerous. And the rest of it, the turbine, the generator, the condenser, the transmission lines, the distribution lines, they're all the same as in a coal-fired power plant. And the efficiency is also about the same. Modern coal-fired power plants are a little bit more efficient actually than a nuclear reactor. So except for this fuel on the inside and more concentrated and the fire on the outside, they're the same. So how did this idea come about? It turns out we did a book called Nuclear Power Deception. You can, I think, download most of it free from our website, IER.org. But it turns out that nuclear power was a fig leaf on this. This is Mike, the first hydrogen bomb. It wasn't a bomb, actually. It was a hydrogen device um, in 1952, exploded in the Marshall Islands. You heard about that yesterday. Um, you know, these were thousands of times more powerful than the bombs that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. People had feared them. Edward Teller really from, be from the beginning, from the first nuclear weapons conference in 1942, wanted to do this design and telegraph it's a boy when the explosion was successful and evaporated a whole island on which it was placed. This was in 1952. In 1953, the Soviets did their own hydrogen bomb. And of course, this was very fast. And so now the whole world is on edge. Now we might not have a, just an atomic bomb war. We might have a hydrogen bomb war, much, much more destructive. Eisenhower was going to make a speech at the United Nations and somebody drafted one for him. It was a very gloom and doom speech. And when he read the draft, he said, give me, this is a paraphrase, give me something good to say. This is too gloom and doom. And you have heard no doubt that in December, Eisenhower, December of 1953, Eisenhower gave his very famous Atoms for Peace speech. This is a time when everybody said nuclear power is going to be very expensive. 
And he offered a deal to the world saying, we'll have this nuclear power. It is going to solve everybody's problems, energy problems. Um, you know, now the third world countries, developing countries are striving for independence, becoming free, India already independent, Pakistan too. So people want more electricity, they want more energy, it will solve your problems. The deal is you don't get nuclear weapons, we have nuclear weapons, but if you commit to non-proliferation, we will develop nuclear energy and share it with you. That's where the non-proliferation treaty came from 15 years later in 1968. Um, and neither India nor Pakistan signed it, as you probably know. So after this speech, there was an 18 month propaganda campaign for nuclear power. And some called it propaganda then, so I'm not putting words into their mouth. In that context, the chairman of the, um, the Atomic Energy Commission, Louis Strauss from South Carolina, South Carolina has played a very big role in the nuclear age because Jimmy Burns from South Carolina was Secretary of State when, when the bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Louis Strauss made this speech to a science writers convention in 1954 saying nuclear power will in our children's lifetime or one day be too cheap to meter. Too cheap to meter means you're basically giving it away. It's going to be so cheap. Now, let me go back to this chart. You see that almost the entire electric system except for the boiler is common. And I don't know why I didn't think about this till we did the research and I'm an electrical engineer. It's just the boiler that's different. 80% of the cost of electricity for residential electricity uh, is downstream from the boiler. So it can never be too cheap to meter unless everything downstream from the boiler is too cheap to meter and has nothing to do with the nuclear reactor. Anyway, that was the propaganda. Even some of the people like Glenn Seaborg who separated plutonium in the Manhattan Project um, and was later the chairman of the AEC, even they started saying, oh, we'll have airplanes that will be bigger than ocean liners. You'll never have to shovel snow on your driveway. We will, it was this like, it was, I think there was an element of self-deception to it. It wasn't all um, just conscious deception. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about fake news. It was, I think people when they were making these speeches were very, very carried away with themselves. At least I, I prefer to believe that rather than it was very cynical. There was certainly a cynical aspect to it. They did go to Japan and sell nuclear power as part of this campaign and help them overcome what was called their nuclear allergy arising from the atomic bombing. So where does that very concentrated fuel come from? There's very little in the reactor, but we have about 250 million tons of mine wastes and mill tailing wastes in the United States, mostly in the Colorado Plateau, Arizona, Utah, New Mexico, and, and Colorado. And um, so that's the top two pictures. The left, bottom left are depleted uranium tailings um, so mother nature didn't make it very easy to make a bomb. You have to enrich the uranium. That is the fissile part that has the chain reaction is only 0.7%. And for, for, for a bomb, you need 90 plus percent or preferable. And for the kind of reactor I showed you, you need four, three, four percent. So you have to enrich the fissile part. And on the right is a spent fuel pool. The used fuel is so hot um, and so radioactive that if evil Knievel rode his motorcycle at 60 miles an hour from one end of a fuel, spent fuel bundle to the other, when it first came out of the reactor, he would be dead before he reached the other end. Dead in a fraction of a second, very radioactive. So, um, while the fuel itself is compact, you know, there's not a lot of material in the spent fuel pool, it, but it is extremely dangerous. There's all this other waste. We have uh, more than half a million tons of depleted uranium and, you know, 
many hundreds of millions of tons of mine waste and mill tailings, even though the United States now imports most of the uranium used in its nuclear power So you've heard about nuclear proliferation. The parts of the nuclear reactor business that are prone to proliferation where they intersect with weapons. Of course, besides the mining of the uranium, there's only one material really that you can make bonds with that occurs in nature. That's uranium. And of that, it's the uranium-235. And at the top, you see uh, uranium enrichment of the type that are in conflict between uh, Iran and the United States and much of Europe. Um, they, these, are, these are like a washing machine, machine cylinder, but they spin much, much faster. That's why they're so tall. Um, at the bottom, you have a plutonium button, as it is called, and you can see why. Um, you can hold uranium and plutonium in your hand because they're mostly alpha radiation. They give you something of a dose of radiation, but they won't kill you like the spent fuel or not instantly and are mostly dangerous if you breathe them in and or get them in your body through a cut or a wound or ingest. So by its nature, nuclear technology is proliferation prone, especially the technologies that we have, which need enriched uranium. So you need uranium enrichment plants. Um, there's one in New, New Mexico. Uh, there, of course, there are many such plants around the world in, in countries that have large amounts of nuclear power, including France and Russia and so on. And um, then when the fuel is put in the reactor, some of the uranium-238, which is not a fuel, becomes plutonium by transmutation in the reactor. Today, we have 80,000 metric tons of spent fuel in the United States. There's much more around the world, of course. And that's enough to make about 100,000 Nagasaki-sized bombs. That's a lot more bombs than in all the nuclear arsenals of the entire world, a lot more, almost an order of magnitude more. Of course, you have to separate the plutonium. This has been done in the commercial sector, a little bit in the United States, but mostly in France, uh, Britain, um, and for Japan and France and Britain, Russia, United States, India, there's 300 metric tons of surplus commercial plutonium sitting in, they're like your sugar canisters, not like that, um, stainless steel. Um, they're sitting in secure facilities around the world. The largest by far is in Britain and then second largest also very large inventory is in France. 300 metric tons, more than the entire military inventory in all nuclear weapon states combined. So this presents a very significant threat. Moreover, it is economically useless because the type of reactor, and I won't go into it, you can ask me about it if you like, uh, for which which was designed to use plutonium after roughly a hundred billion dollars with a B expenses around the world was never commercialized. It was the dream reactor to make more fuel than it consumes, but never commercialized. So we have all this plutonium sitting around. And remember all these reactors make plutonium in the course of their operation. It's just part of the deal, uranium 238, which in a pressurized water reactor is about 96% of the initial fuel. Some of it becomes plutonium, it's consumed in, uh, in, in the process of power production, and then some of it is left over. So about 1% of the spent fuel is plutonium. What about France? Let's talk about France. 75 to 80% of the electricity in France comes from nuclear power. They export and import be very difficult to run their electricity system if they didn't do that for technical reasons. They do some, use some plutonium as a fuel separating it. Uh, that plant that you see in the top right photo is uh, at La Hague. Uh, it, is, um, it separates plutonium uh, from spent fuel. It makes a lot of waste. What you see at the bottom uh, is a Greenpeace photo of the discharge pipe into the English Channel, 
Now, dumping of radioactive waste in the oceans is prohibited under the London Dumping Convention from 1970, I think. Uh, but this is, um, the French and the British who also do this say that this is not really dump dumping, it's discharges because dumping is, you know, if you put it in a, if you put the same waste in a barrel and throw it overboard from a ship, it would be dumping, but it's, this is not dumping. They have polluted the oceans all the way to the Arctic. 12 of the 15 countries that kind of look to the um, safety of the oceans have protested and asked uh, Britain and France to stop this. They haven't yet done so. France, after Chernobyl, France, and like many other countries, including the United States, that designed nuclear reactors, uh, redesigned their reactors and started a new design. It's called uh, the European Pressurized Water Reactor. It was supposed to be very safe. It was also much bigger and uh, much touted. So when the climate change issue came around, um, they offered a, a, a contract to the Finns and I showed you a photograph of that reactor in the beginning, the old Pilioto reactor. In 2005, I think it was, a, um, a fixed price turnkey contract around 2005. It was supposed to come on in 2009. Now its costs have doubled, tripled. It is much delayed. It hasn't been turned on yet, uh, 10 plus years after the supposed startup date. Even though the Okeliodo reactor was not succeeding, they started the same one in Flamanville in, um, in, um, in France, in the west of France. That reactor also ran into the same problems, delays and cost overruns. And I'll talk a little bit more about that and tell you why it's not a good idea to do nuclear power, power plants for addressing our climate problem. These are the locations of nuclear reactors. We've got that spent fuel uh, in pools and dry storage at every one of these sites. Some of these reactors are, uh, of these reactors are all operating. Uh, there are also some closed reactors. About 115 or 120 reactors were built that operated. Um, Brookhaven National Lab, let me show you a picture of Fukushima. So if, when the Fukushima accident happened in 2011, uh, one of my great worries, which quick, right away, same day, I think I issued a press release same day or the next day, was about reactor number four on the left there, which was not operating actually, uh, but it had a spent fuel pool, reactor number three, I can't remember which one, I think it was number four, uh, that, its spent fuel pool might blow up uh, because spent fuel pools, if they lose their coolant, um, uh, they can also get very hot. They can have meltdowns, just like a nuclear reactor. You know, these, this destruction of the reactors that happened was from hydrogen explosions, and hydrogen is generated during meltdown. The Brookhaven National Lab calculated in 1997 that the worst case spent fuel pool accident in the United States, if it were, you know, very hot spent fuel just out of the reactor, uh, could cause tens of thousands of cancers and in today's dollars, more than $700 billion in property damage. That's billions of dollars. You know, they're still counting the damage from Fukushima. It's going to be big. So there's a term also accidents can happen. The, the, and, and they happen in all the difference between these two accidents and say the accident in Texas City, Texas in 1946, when there was a natural gas explosion is a lot of people died in that explosion. A lot of, there was a lot of property destruction but just like the tsunami in Fukushima, the parts, of, the parts of that area that were destroyed by the tsunami, you could pick up the pieces and rebuild. These accidents make everything around them radioactive for hundreds of square miles, thousands of square miles, and uninhabitable. Although the establishment will say 
you can go back. It's only slightly radioactive. People really don't want to send their children to a radioactive school. Most people at least. I wouldn't. So some of the spent fuel is also stored in these casks when it is cool enough. So after five years in the United States, it's, some of it is taken out and stored. There are many cask designs. But uh, after 9-11, I started worrying about these and also about spent fuels because they don't have those strong concrete domes of the reactors. And they're much, much more vulner vulnerable to malevolent acts. So the kind of the kind of releases of radioactivity uh, that Brookhaven National Lab and not everybody accepts the result of that study. The NRC said, "Don't worry, it's not going to be that bad." Fortunately, we haven't had to find out. Um, but all of these things are vulnerable to malevolent acts. We can do better than this. It would cost. It might increase the cost of electricity by 2% of nuclear electricity by 2%. And nuclear electricity is just 20% of the supply. So by a fraction that you probably wouldn't notice on your bill, we can harden the storage. We can make it less difficult to attack. And a lot of nuclear power plants are on rivers and lakefronts. So these things are visible and targetable. But the Nuclear Regulatory Commission says, don't worry. I'll leave it to you whether you want to or not. Now, why is nuclear power not suitable for climate change? So we have a lot of zero CO2 sources of energy, fortunately. So we have some choice. We have solar, we have wind, we have onshore wind. We have offshore wind is a fabulously developed technology. Um, we have nuclear, nuclear is low CO2 technology also. And ideally all of these are, if you had only a nuclear electricity system or only a solar electricity system, they would all be zero CO2. So we have some choice. We need to drastically get going. This is the approximate timetable from the most recent report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, 60% greenhouse gas reduction by 2030. And now greenhouse gas gases, of course, come from your cars. They come from industry. They come from burning natural gas for space heating and water heating and from burning coal and natural gas and a little bit of oil in power stations. The easiest place to eliminate emissions is in the electricity sector. And the most necessary place to eliminate emis emissions is in the electricity sector, because to get rid of emissions from automobiles, from industry, from all the other sectors where we burn fossil fuels, for almost all of it, the easiest, best, cheapest way to do it is to electrify it. So like electric vehicles, electric buses. I'll show you some pictures later. So we need in the West, in the wealthier countries under treaty commitments to eliminate, by my cal approximate calculation, uh, make greenhouse gas emissions zero by 2045. Net means you might have to have a little sequestration through agriculture or something like that. But essentially you need to get rid of emissions almost completely by, by 2040, 2045, 2050. You can argue about the date by a few years here and there. This means you have to increase the efficiency and electrify all these things, and you're going to increase electricity use. For nuclear to supply one third of the electricity we need, just in the United States, you have to build eight reactors per year. For it to supply half the electricity, you have to build 12, one a month. The main issues in addressing climate, leaving aside all the risks, the accidents, the spent fuel, the plutonium, if you leave all that aside and say, we're in a climate emergency, let's get it done. Let's focus just on low CO2. You'd have to build about a reactor a month. Uh, the main shortage is not of low CO2 power sources. The main shortages are time from this timetable. And of course, the main, shortage also is money. You have a limited amount of money to solve this problem. In this country, 
you know, there's a lot of printing money that goes on because the dollar is a global reserve currency, but most countries can't print money. And then even in this country, there are limits. All right, so how are we doing on money? So let me rely on Wall Street. These are the estimates. So Lazard, the Wall Street firm, publishes estimates of electricity costs of electricity sources every November or December. Uh, this is the most recent from last year, 2019. So onshore wind, so I've, I've adjusted it so the numbers are equivalent to one nuclear power plant. So for wind, the cost of building wind would be $3,900. Offshore wind, $52.65. Offshore wind costs are coming down very rapidly. They're already, you know, the cost of electricity is already about 30% less than what I have shown here in Europe, not in the United States, because we don't have, all, we have almost no offshore wind in the United States. Solar, 4,400. Um, and nuclear, 9550. Uh, now, the middle uh, column there shows you the costs of electricity from those capital costs. And you can see wind and solar are cheapest. Now, with wind and solar, you need some storage. I'll show you an aggregate calculation later on. But nuclear also won't work by itself. You need um, nuclear is too inflexible to supply uh, variable electricity loads that change a lot. And actually, it doesn't work very well with solar and wind once you get to 30 40, 50% solar and wind nuclear doesn't work too well. So wind offshore costs is decreasing rapidly. We practically haven't. So in Maryland, I can tell you we have more offshore wind alone than we need for all electricity applications. And we have even more solar than that. There are no, Wyoming alone has wind, wind resources equal to all the nuclear power plants in the United States. We have almost 100 operating nuclear plants. The problem with nuclear is not just cost. So it takes 10 to 20 years to build. So I should tell you how long it typically takes to build a large scale production, utility scale production. So nuclear is 10 to 20 years. I already gave you examples in France and Finland. So you don't have to say, we have too much regulation in the United States and so on. The Finns want this reactor. They, they gave a turnkey contract to the French. They're supposed to be the experts, not done yet after 15 years. So, and this is not a new story. It's all an old story. This happened the last time in the first round of nuclear power. And so let me give you a little data on that. Um, and I'll take just a few more minutes. So we have a shortage of time. The nuclear renaissance was announced in 2005 in the United States. We're gonna solve the climate problem. We have a new uh, streamlined licensing system. We can do it fast. We have safer uh, reactor designs. This was 15. We we'll gave loan guarantees to private industry to build these things. There were 30 applications. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission built a whole new building to staff the review of these license applications, more than 30 reactors. Only four were started. Two of those in South Carolina were canceled after billions of expenditures. Two are being built and they are delayed and over budget, not completed as yet. Only one reactor has been completed, Watts Bar 2. And this reactor was not a new reactor, it was not started in recently in the 2000s. It was started in 1972, abandoned in 1996, and taken up again and completed. And then since that, and it has had problems off and on. In the initial round, almost as many reactors were canceled as were built, which led Forbes, not an anti-nuclear organization, to call nuclear power the failure of the US nuclear power program ranks as the largest managerial disaster in business history, a disaster on a monumental scale. So fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, that was the nuclear renaissance, shame on me. 
fool me thrice, that would be these small modular reactors and so on, already escalating in cost before a single one is built. I don't know about fool me thrice. So you'll have to invent a saying for that. Uh, but what is at stake is not a joke. What is at stake is can we solve the climate problem in time? Already it is too late. You know, we're suffering a lot of damages. 2017, the damage from extreme climate events was more almost $1,000 per person in the United States just in one year. And these are just the extreme events that cause more than a billion dollars in damage each. So what's the record of wind and slow solar? We're not, you know, not everybody is doing wind and solar the way it should be done and can be done. So Iowa has 41.7% of its electricity production, you know, from wind power plants. Now it exports and imports from the state because we're part of larger grids. Missouri is 3.6%. It's a non-ideological thing. Texas has the most wind capacity. California has the most solar. So states have done quite a lot. It can be accelerated very easily. And in my opinion, we can meet the timetable we need to meet and we can do it at lower cost. So I did a four year project assessing the costs of business as usual some efficiency, some nuclear, some fossil fuels, uh, and compared it to 100% renewables with storage, demand response, smart grids, all the things you need to deal with what happens when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow. People say, what are you gonna do? I know the sun doesn't shine at night because it is the definition of night. And I know the wind doesn't blow all the time, and I'm an electrical engineer, so I'm not going to tell you to do something that won't turn on your lights when you flip the switch. This will be more reliable if done right than the system we have now because distributed electricity sources can be made more resilient and you can more easily supply emergency loads when the grid is down. Actually, this was demonstrated in Fukushima. There was one point of light after that tsunami at a university there uh, where there was a microgrid with solar and local generation and storage. And they were able to keep the hospital emergency loads going when everything else goes down. So this can be more reliable and cheaper, I think. So I won't detain you on all the benefits of renewable energy, very little water use, you know, you practically eliminate your air pollution. There's some pollution involved in making solar panels and wind turbines and nuclear power plants and coal power plants. Those are, I think, on the first order of approximation comparable. So it's not like we should be profligate and wasting electricity, but um, you eliminate all the pollution from burning things. My motto for you is let's send Prometheus back to the gods. We can do energy without fire. I, uh, Tanya told some of you that I would tell you something about cancer. Um, females are much more susceptible to radiation than males. These are National Academy of Sciences data. Children much more susceptible as you can easily imagine. And I'll quickly go through how you do renewable energy with solar and wind. First, let me tell you how inefficient we are. Two thirds of that nuclear energy is discharged as waste heat at the power plant. 80, we go to war for oil, but 80% of the oil that we burn in a car is wasted. Only 20% comes out of the wheels. We waste most of the energy that we burn in the house um, to heat. It doesn't actually heat the house, it goes out the windows. Okay, on the left, you have electric trucks. Electric trucks are 80% efficient on the energy compared to 20% efficient for petroleum vehicles. On the right, you have 100% um, electric long distance trucks. These things already exist. They are somewhat more expensive, but they will be cheap pretty soon. Smart grids, we have all this technology. Can we do it fast enough? Is there a track record for doing things fast? 
So we did uh, oil lamps to electric bulbs in 20 or 30 years. You know, whale oil was the elite lighting fuel in the 1850s. And petroleum actually had some role in saving the whales. Uh, but as time has passed, we need to get rid of the petroleum. Um, so electric bulbs, of course, electric bulbs, incandescent bulbs are about 1% efficient on the fuel. 1% of the fuel comes out as photons that you can see. Uh, our vaunted LEDs are much more efficient, about 6% on the fuel. If you're burning fuel in a coal-fired or nuclear power plant. But we did this transition in 20 or 30 years. The French decided to go to nuclear in the oil crisis of 1973, and they made that transition in also about 20 years. So it can be done. Horses to tractors, also done. Summary, nuclear is costly. It can't be done in time. It is dangerous. It is obsolete. This is much better. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow, such a lot of very important information uh, to digest. Um, we have some questions for you from the Facebook feed. Should so I, I share will... my screen or? Uh, sure, yeah, and then everyone will see you. If yeah. that works, great, perfect. You can see you beautifully. Um, so on the Facebook feed, we had a couple of questions. The first one is, what is the extent and impacts of the ocean pollution from British and French discharging into the English Channel? So the, the main radionuclide they discharge is tritium, which is radioactive hydrogen. And because it's hydrogen, it combines with oxygen and becomes radioactive water. So that's what they are discharging. I, so radioactive water has been treated with disrespect since as a dangerous material. Uh, it was initially, you know, in the nuclear weapons complex, they used to give a six pack of beer and that was all joked about to workers who had ingested tritium and said, drink this and, you know, you, know, you will be able to discharge it into your toilet pretty soon and it'll be gone. But there's some truth to that, in, uh, to be honest. But tritium crosses the placenta. So babies who are developing do not have the repair mechanisms. I personally think that tritium is quite a dangerous material. Uh, during pregnancy, and especially the first trimester of pregnancy. So for women who want to have their children, I think we don't worry about them enough. Um, there's the risk of early failed pregnancies. There's the risk of malformations. And this is something that I'm actually researching currently and will be writing about in the coming year. Uh, that's the main radionuclide they discharge, and they um, and they have not stopped. I don't see any other questions. Tanya, you're on mute. Yes, we have more questions. Let me. I'm kind of moving back and forth here. Um, a next question, and, and the commenter also says a fantastic presentation. Um, so we have another question about um, HB6 in Ohio. In the state of Ohio, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. In the state of Ohio, a huge racketeering scandal surrounds House Bill 6, legislation which requires Ohio taxpayers to pay subsidies for two aging nuclear plants in the state, among other things. Do you see a long tradition of political manipulation and corruption behind the promotion of nuclear power in the US? Well, I've already told you that the whole thing was based on a deception. And yesterday I spoke about the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The bomb project was supposed to be about the Nazis, but it was not stopped when it was known that the Nazis. So the nuclear enterprise, in my opinion, both on the bomb side and on the power side has been based, and the public still believes a lot of things that I think are not quite accurate, if I might put it politely. It, the nuclear power project as a social co construct was based on a massive, massive deception. 
I don't think much get good can come of a massive project that comes of this action. Now we have an entrenched industry. Uh, their power plants are aging. They're more costly to run and they're asking for subsidies. Um, and I, first, I am aware of the scandal in Ohio. There's been a parallel scandal in Illinois. Uh, I personally think that, you know, existing nuclear power plants are low CO2 sources. So you hear a lot of talk about that. But there's a question of money. Should we be paying more to nuclear reactors that are aging under a regulatory regime that I think is not very vigilant? And one of the reactors in Ohio, at Toledo actually, uh, due to the lack of vigilance of the NRC to a known problem of corrosion of the reactor vessel head almost blew up on Ohioans and their neighbors uh, about 20, 20 years ago. I don't remember the date exactly. It had a pineapple sized corrosion hole in the reactor vessel head that a fraction of an inch between the, between the reactor and the people of Ohio. Disaster. Uh, potential. And this was due to lack of vigilance. It was a problem that was known. So I, I think that these kind of subsidies are not warranted, especially as renewable energy is much cheaper. Um, and, uh, you know, the fact that corrupt practices are needed to get these kind of rebates. One thing that I have researched a lot and that I'd like to comment on, although a little bit not directly in the center of my talk, but to the question, is that all of these extra costs really burden low income people terribly. We've done a whole book on this about Maryland. I was shocked by how many people become homeless because they can't, there's a conflict between their rent and their utility bills. And now in the middle of the pandemic, it's even worse. I think Ohioans should look more deeply about whether they want to sell, you know, give these hundreds of millions of dollars to existing nuclear reactors or build renewable energy, which is, which will create more jobs and is the energy of the future. So I, you know, corrupt practices, of course, make it all completely worse. I think in a way, the origin of the nuclear industry was not, if not financially corrupt, morally corrupt, because it was based on a deception things that were known to be false. Thank you. Um, we have a couple questions related to fusion. Um, we've been hearing a lot about, well, there are two, uh, two separate questions. One is about thorium and one is about fusion, but we've been hearing a lot about thorium lately as, a, as an alternative cleaner um, fuel. And then we've been hearing a lot about fusion as imminently possible or already occurring. So I'm wondering if you could comment on those two energy forms. Yeah, the two very different things. So thorium belongs in the same category of the kind of reactors I've been talking about. Contrary to the talk you see, thorium is actually not a fuel. As I said, uranium is the only thing that occurs in significant amounts in nature that is actually a nuclear fuel. Thorium needs to be converted to uranium-233 in a reactor. So you can't actually start a reactor with thorium. So you need uranium enrichment plants or plutonium or an existing stock of fissile material to start a thorium reactor. The thorium reactor designs that people love are called a liquid fuel thorium reactor. A pilot plant was built in Oak Ridge. Uh, it was very small, designed to be, it worked. It operated reasonably well, but it created nuclear waste. Uh, it had fluoride fuel. Uh, that fluoride fuel is sitting in, in concrete uh, tanks at the bottom of that reactor since it was shut in the early 70s or 1970. It cost, um, in today's dollars, it costs about 60 or $70 million to build. Its decommissioning costs have been estimated at more than $400 million. Nobody knows what to do with that nuclear waste because it's in fluoride form. It can't be buried that way. And the worst part about a thorium reactor, you know, they all tell you it's going to be cheap. I personally don't believe that. I'm from Missouri in that really regard, I'm the show me state. But I don't think, we don't have the time to develop new reactors. And the second thing is liquid fuel thorium reactors all have uh, uranium separation plants, uranium-233 separation plants at the reactor site. So in my opinion, 
it is the most proliferation prone reactor that has been designed, although the claim is to the contrary. I did a Science Friday debate on this in 2012, and um, I will try to put up the link, but you can go to IER.org and you know, search for Science Friday Thorium and then you'll, you'll come up with it. Fusion. I did my doctorate in fusion, of course. I finished in 1972. Uh, fusion is always 30 years away. Recently, we hear that it may not be 30 years away. The one they're building in France is 30 years away, at least. If it works perfectly, and we won't know until the mid 30s in the best of worlds, um, nobody will buy it. It's too big, it's too costly, it's too unwieldy, and you have to shut it down for months to basically maintain it every few years. It will create some radioactive waste, but not much. Um, there are more compact forms of nuclear fusion reaction uh, of the same design. There's been a New York Times article about it. There were no numbers that I saw in the press. I haven't read the, the Plasma Physics Journal article about it, so I don't know how far away they are. But I think all of these designs are quite far away. I'd welcome um, the kind of fusion reaction reactor that's being developed in Lawrenceville, New Jersey. That's a proton boron reaction. It's like a fusion battery, no nuclear waste, uh, small if it works, so flexible. But I still think that these fusion reactions are far away and they can always be tremendous innovations. And I'm not against nuclear fusion research. I think there should be some modest investment in it. The, the French project is 20 odd billion dollars and it is a waste of money in my opinion. Um, but I wouldn't bank on fusion for climate. The time question is so, and we have solar, we have wind, we have smart grid, we have storage, we have everything we need. We should get on with it. And if something new comes along that makes it better, you know, open the door, leave the door open. Great, um, one final question. We have just a couple minutes left. Um, someone has asked about whether it, if you think the renewable energy deadlines of 2030 and 40 will actually be met. Or do you think they're just going to get pushed back more and more? Well, you know, these are deadlines that we need to meet if we're going to have that 1.5 degrees Celsius limit that was agreed on in Paris in 2015. On, on current performance of global leaders, we are not on track and it will not be met. We're at one slightly over one degree. We already are in over our heads, often literally. Um, and um, the damage is already extremely severe in many, many parts of the world. And um, the current performance of, of the people in charge is not good overall, even those who are using good words. And in this country, of course, there, in this country is the states and corporations and individuals that are doing a fair amount, but it's not enough by a long shot. It can be met. So I did this project on Maryland that I think is applicable to the entire United States because most, except maybe Alaska, which is a very unique uh, technical situation. Um, but um, I think we can, we can do 100% electricity by 2035. I do think we have the technology to make um, uh, vehicles electric. Uh, if we have sensible policies, we can even do it economically. Um, and certainly we have the technology to electrify buildings very efficiently uh, with geothermal heat pumps and cold climate heat pumps. So it can be done, I think. Uh, it will create a lot of jobs. I do think we need to have a just transition for oil and coal, oil and gas and coal workers and to make sure they have good jobs in the communities in which they live. Uh, and we're not doing that. So on current track, you know, no. Uh, can we do it? Yes. Thank you so much for that. So we're at 11.20 now. We'll close out. I'm just going to close with just a couple of comments from the Facebook feed uh, from Susan Southard. Fantastic presentation. Thank you. And from Carlos Umania. Wow. Thank you for that presentation. So I echo the words. Thank you so much. And may I, may yeah, I absolutely. That, may I put up that thorium uh, thing? Yeah, we can put it up actually. Um, I'll send it to you later and then you can put it up. 
Okay. Yeah, and you can put it in the chat here if you see there's a chat button at the bottom of your screen. Yeah, and we can copy it, it into the Facebook feed for okay. everyone. Uh, let yeah. me put it up on the chat. If you leave the Zoom on, I'll put it in the chat. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. It really was. Bye.